thanks everyone for coming, for joining us tonight for our conversation. I just want to say just a brief word about the format. We have about an hour total, and there's going to be a question and answer period at the end, and there will be two mic runners. Um, so if you motion to them, they'll find you if you have a question. Um, and our conversation tonight is going to be guided by seven photographs. Here's the first one. You see it? This first photograph is a nice reminder of the festival's theme, which, as many of you know, is the body. Kareem, this is you in action playing for Power Memorial Academy, where your team won 71 straight games and three state titles. This is such a gorgeous image. It's kind of a body in your face, literally, really. Um, so could you tell us what this image conjures for you? Well, for me, this uh, brings back uh, some fond memories and uh, some tough ones, too. Uh, high school was uh, quite an experience for me. The first year, I experienced a lot of frustration and had to learn how to work harder and learn the fundamentals of the game in order to do well at it, and I was totally consumed with it. Mm -hmm. The very first game I, I played in high school, I ended up, I was in tears. I, I was oh. crying, in the, and it, it, but it was good, though. I, I'm, I'm in the, we lost uh, to a team from Brooklyn. You lost? Of course. <laughs> yes. We lost to a team in Brooklyn, and their star player was doing globetrotter tricks on us. Okay? Oh, my gosh. I remember at one point he, he drove for the basket and put his foot on my knee and, and jumped past me <laughs> and, lay, and laid the ball up. And after the game, I was, I was in tears. And um, I remember I, I'm crying, and I looked up, and all the other guys on the team, I was 14 years old. I was in the ninth grade mm -hmm. playing varsity basketball. <clears throat> and all the other guys on the team were, some were 16, 17 years old. They were a lot more mature at that point. And I remember looking looking up, and they were all looking at me like I just landed from, from Mercury or, or Mars someplace. And I realized that um, I had to grow up and <clears throat> get a lot tougher and, and learn the game. And it, actually, it, it really helped me. And so your freshman year was tough then because um, th there was just this huge adjustment into moving into a high school. And, and Power Memorial, a lot of you may know, is, is, has had like a history of its own. Um, New, yeah. New York City, uh, High school basketball is a blood sport. I, I, I came there from grade school where we had people that were very nurturing and it, it was very, very tame. You were great. They t that's all they told you probably. That's, that's all they told us. You, you're going to do wonders. You're, you're wonderful. And then I go into it and it's um, the Roman Coliseum. Yeah. Yeah. Heads are rolling and things like that. So uh, it, it it helped me. It helped me a lot. That's great. And so that, that, that leads into my next question, which is um, ESPN just last year named you the best high school player of all time. And I wonder if you could say, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right here. I wonder if you could say anything about your, anything more about your high school playing experience that, that set you up maybe for, you know, such a great career after that. I was very fortunate to be be playing in New York City. My, my high school was only 12 blocks from the old Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. And my high school coach allowed the NBA teams to practice in our gym. Uh -huh. So when I was in the ninth grade, my, my freshman year, I got to meet Bill Russell and Ro Red Auerbach and yes. other NBA stars. Mm -hmm. And part of the perks of it was at Madison Square Garden, they had our names on a door list. So I could go anytime. That's awesome. I could go to Madison Square Garden and, and watch NBA yeah. basketball, and I picked Bill Russell as my role model. Perfect choice. Mm -hmm. I learned Indeed. all about the game, watching him. I absorbed it, talked to my coach mm -hmm. about the lessons that I learned, mm -hmm. and it, it enabled me to make a lot of progress and figure out what I needed to do on the court to, to affect the game in my team's favor. And I think that really was a key. Plus, my high school coach agreed with the Celtics philosophy, uh, get the ball to the open man, that person should take the shot, play tough defense. Mm -hmm. 
So you were a team yeah. more than just it was all uh, about, four it was other all guys about team. around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely all about team. He would ask us trick questions like, all right, how many guys on the Celtics got 20 points? Mm -hmm. And in those days, nobody on the Celtics would score 20 points. Mm -hmm. They'd have four or five guys that had between 13 and 18 mm -hmm. points, and they, they just whipped everybody. Yeah. So uh, I, I learned a whole lot yeah. from that experience and took it forward. Terrific. Next slide, please. So this is John Wooden, your legendary coach at UCLA. The two of you are quite close. Yes, what is, we were. Yeah, what does this photograph make you remember? Uh, just uh, what a wonderful man he was. He understood our ambition as athletes, but he wanted us to learn lessons that would help us make it through life. He wanted us to become good, <clears throat> good husbands, good fathers, uh, good parents. You know, th that type of thing. He wanted us to be good citizens. And he used basketball as a metaphor to teach that. Again, it was all about family, uh, the sacrifices <clears throat> that you had to make to make your family successful. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sacrifices that many of the people sitting in the audience do every day for their children and loved ones. Mm -hmm. That's what you gotta do for your team. Yeah. So uh, we got that lesson and didn't really understand that that's what we were learning. Mm -hmm. Coach Wooden was very crafty that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Coaching has to strike a, met, strike a balance, actually, between body, training the body and training the mind. I know our college coach sometimes would administer psychological exams, actually, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Um, but um, could you tell us a little bit about how Wooden balanced those two? Well, he would tell us that uh, we had to be in shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he'd give us simple drills, but every day, Every succeeding day, we had to do those drills a little bit faster. And you don't notice it as it's going along, but... How did he get to go, go faster, speaking of bodies? It just, you had less time to do everything. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So after a while, you know, we're doing everything at, at, at break speed, at uh, break pace speed, mm -hmm. and still he would get on us to uh, execute the fundamentals correctly, when to pass the ball, et cetera, you know, defensive stance how to get to the right position uh -huh. to, to play good defense, where and when to pass the ball to, to play effective offense. Yeah. Had to get your, sh your shot off in, in less and less time. Uh -huh. So it, it enabled us to, to learn and, and progress. I, I remember my freshman year, which was the, my first year under a system, I would come home from practice and I'd have to take a nap before I did my reading assignments mm -hmm. or anything I had to write uh, for class. Mm -hmm. And he, he also wanted us to, to do well in class. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he knew how to put the program together and, and force us into a situation where we had to adjust and, and learn at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people in the audience may or may not know that um, in, <clears throat> in the sporting world, the wooden quotes are passed around like basketballs and footballs themselves. Um, and when I played in college, our assistant coach, Mickey DeMoss, would come out every day in, in practice and uh, before practice started and, and read us a quote for the day to mull over um, while we were stretching, speaking of body of mind. Um, and a lot of them came from John Wooden. So um, he's, had a, he's had an effect on a lot of players um, just in that way. Is there a memorable saying of his that, that, might, that stuck with you all these years? The one, the one I remember the most is, um Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And it meant that you, you really had to understand what you needed to learn and get it down, or when you got to the moment of truth, you wouldn't do as well as you had hoped to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, in fact, we, on the, there was a, a year that our team was supposed to make it to the final four because it was in our, on our home court and we didn't make it and uh, they had had t-shirts printed out in advance um, about how the, 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 the venue was gonna sell out, and on the back was that statement, <laughs> if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. We had to practice in those the whole next year, <laughs> it was terrible. Um, so, thanks John Wooden. <laughs> um, um, the, one, the, the quote of Wooden's that, that, that stood out for me when I was reading through, ESPN has a whole collection of them online if you wanna check, they're called Woodenisms. Um, 
is consider the rights of others before your own feelings and the feelings of others before your own rights. And there seems to be something of a, of a humanitarian thread running through this one especially. Um, is that the case? Oh, absolutely. I, in, in saying that, he, he wanted us to understand that it wasn't all about us. Most, most young people in their late teens and early 20s thinks, think that it's all about me. I'm this wonderful person coming onto the world stage. And uh, it doesn't work like mm -hmm, that. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and how else was that humanitarian impulse visible in Wooden's actions? Well, I, I think the, the way that he taught us, if you, if you read any of his books on coaching, you, you'll hear him say that it's, it's not good to humiliate and berate, uh, as a coach, it's not good to humiliate and berate your, your players. Mm -hmm. You have to explain to them what the best way to, to do things is, mm -hmm. and encourage them to do that, and let them and give them practical examples as to how they'll fail if they mm -hmm. don't. But if they if they fail to see that lesson and, and don't get it, you, you don't re resort to uh, histrionics and um, a, a, a very mean spirited a, a mean spirited approach does not work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must have made you. Uh, even more not want to let him down in a way. That kind of quiet yes. approach yeah. can be pretty powerful. Yeah. Because, you know, he, he was one, and he'd comment on it, but he, he, would, he would use sarcasm, but it, it wasn't the type that made you feel like you're that tall. Mm -hmm. I, I always contrast his, his manner and method with that of Bobby Knight, mm -hmm. who... Uh, no, cha uh, no chairs being thrown at UCLA. No chairs being no. thrown, uh, and Bobby Knight's a very successful Mm -hmm. coach who know, knew the game, taught it well. I, I know several guys who play for him. They all admire and respect mm -hmm. him. But uh, for me personally, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't like his, mm -hmm. his approach mm -hmm. in, in, in that area. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So you yourself have coached a few teams. Um, it, it, it's probably an obvious question, but did, how did Wooden shape your approach to coaching then in these ways? Or? Well, Coach Wooden helped me understand that the group has to learn as a group. You can't have a couple of guys that understand it and get it, and they're on one plane and the rest of the team is on another. You, ha you have to develop some type of cohesion with all of the parts that are on the court at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that can be hard because some guys have to catch up to uh, learning the fundamentals of the game at a certain level. And some guys are just brilliant, and nobody's going to get to that level. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand how to keep the peace. Uh, I remember Keith Erickson, who played for Coach Wooden, he graduated in 1965, he played with Gail Goodrich. Mm -hmm. And Gail was an exceptional player. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was a dead-eye shot. And he needed to take the majority of his shots. And Keith wanted to know how come he didn't get more shots. So Coach Wooden, <laughs> Coach Wooden had to explain to him that he wasn't Gail in, in a way that Keith could accept it and, and still continue to want to contribute to the, to the team's success. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that, you have to be uh, part statesman and uh, part discipline, disciplinarian to do that. And Coach Wooden had it down. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, so is there anything that you do differently from Coach Wooden when you're working with a team? Not consciously. Uh -huh. I bet. <laughs> Why change it? <laughs> yeah, when you uh, when you've been an apprentice to the wizard, you know you don't uh, you don't want to mm -hmm. want to stray too far. You'll wake up and the brooms will be throwing all those <laughs> buckets of water, and you'll be floating out out the door. Yeah, we'll have the next slide, please. So this um, photo is the cover of your book, I don't know if you can see it, about, yes, the, can. about the season you spent on an Apache Indian reservation coaching basketball and teaching history. How did this coaching experience differ from the other coaching experience you've had? I, I really enjoyed uh, this season that I spent coaching at the White Mountain Apache Reservation because the kids there, they love the sport, but they don't understand what they need in terms of their life. Mm -hmm. And I had studied a lot about Apache culture and 
the history of the Apache Nation uh, in research that I'd done on um, the Old West. I was uh, studying about the Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, black troops were stationed at Fort Apache from the time it opened in, in 1872 until, until the day it closed in 1922. So the Apache Indians had had a lot of interaction with black Americans mm -hmm. and didn't really harbor any prejudices. So I, I was really able to, to be listened to. And I, I, the whole idea for me to be there, the, what the coaches wanted me to be there to do would, was to encourage them to pursue their education. Mm. And it's, it's a very difficult message to get across because they all have this feeling of that they've been um, taken advantage of. And this, this grievance is something that is collective in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best way to deal with that is to educate yourself and make yourself ready to participate in what, what's going on in America. And most of these, most of the Apache Nation, they withdraw. So on the Apache Reservation, you find the worst things that are happening in, in our inner cities, uh, not very good educational levels, no job opportunities, substance abuse, teenage pregnancy, uh, parents abandoning their children. And uh, it's something that we tried to, uh, to counteract, but it, it, it was very difficult. But I, I was ha glad I had the chance. Uh, they listened to me a little bit. Mm -hmm. They learned some basketball, so mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was a good experience for me. I also taught a class, uh, a history class, mm -hmm. about the Apache culture. Oh, wow. And it surprised them that I knew a lot more about their culture than they did. Huh? Do um, you think you inspired them to learn a little bit more then? Yes, I <laughs> Besides did. Besides what you taught them, yeah, that's I, great. I did, and yeah. right about that time they started uh, teaching the Apache language to the kids. And that, that really yeah. has a, had a good effect yeah. because all of a sudden they connected with their roots and um, their traditions in ways that, that were very important. Sure. Yeah, so I, I hope that things have improved there, but it, it's very tough. One of the kids in that picture is now the head coach. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. Which one? Because I read the book. Jeez, I can't. Well, but yeah. what's his name? Yeah. His name is Kyle Goklish. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he's, he's the head coach Perfect. there. Perfect. Oh, good. And he went to the University of Arizona. Oops. We'll get it. Oh, I think it's uh, back. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Kyle went to the University of Arizona on a cross-country uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. He was a, a four-letter athlete, uh, basketball, yeah. football, track and field, and cross-country. Terrific. Cool. Did you get any uh, special insight uh, while you were there into Apache culture's relationship to, to bodies to, to connect to the festival theme here? Well, it, it, was, it was interesting uh, to me just how they did did not uh, relate to size in, in the same way that mm -hmm. most people do. And um, for people who, do, who don't know, the, the Apaches were very good at <clears throat> ambush um, warfare, uh, more or less like the Viet Cong. You, a, lot of people would, a lot of people would find themselves walking into a horseshoe, and all of a sudden people would jump up and be shooting arrows and bullets at you, and you're standing inside of a a circle almost, and uh, that that was very successful for them. So they they don't mind the fact that they're not very tall people, mm -hmm. but th that that didn't bother them. Yeah, yeah. I remember in the in the book there are some some players who there's one that's remarkably tall for for an, for an, for right. Apache, and yeah. and you kind of um, focus on him a little bit, but you I think realize that some of the less less tall uh, fellows could still make use of what they had, yeah. And they accepted the fact from me that, that there were things that I could teach them. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. I, I really appreciated mm -hmm. that. That's terrific, yeah. yeah. Next slide, please. So people probably don't know you as a yogi, although I understand that the um, Chicago Tribune ran a, a piece that focused on this, so maybe more people in this room do than, than others. Um, how long have you been doing yoga? I've been doing yoga uh, formally since the late 70s. That was, I guess, the, f the first time it sort of became an art that was practiced in the U.S. Um, I'm trying to remember my yoga Probably. history. <laughs> um, what attracted you to it? 
Well, when I was in high school, I, I read about uh, yoga. And there was a, a book that I read called Autobiography of a Yogi. And it talks about remarkable things that this, uh, this yogi observed and participated in. His name was uh, Sri Paramahansa Yogananda. And he started uh, something called the Self-Realization Fellowship, which tried to teach uh, universal consciousness uh, through yoga. And um, I, I was very fascinated by it. And then uh, I became aware that there was a gentleman living and teaching in Los Angeles named Bikram Chaudhary, who was mm -hmm. a student of Paramahansa Yogananda's brother. So I found someone who, who studied that style of yoga, and they told me where I could go and take lessons. And then finally, I, I met uh, Bikram Chaudhary. And um, he had me start coming to his classes. And I have to say that uh, I would not have played basketball as long as I did if it had not been for my yoga practice. It was really very effective uh, preventive maintenance for any athlete. Mm -hmm. And any athlete who wants to uh, develop their flexibility will, uh, will greatly benefit uh, from yoga. Mm -hmm. And here in the West, we're very good at strength training and cardiovascular endurance training. But we leave out the flexibility aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, we suffer yeah. a little bit. Uh, by not I including that in, a, yeah. in our training ritual. Mm -hmm. That's right. Your, your son is a yoga instructor and yes. um, some sort of champion yoga, Bikram yoga practitioner. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, Bikram had a, a contest, a, a competition for the people who practice his style of yoga to see who the, who the best was at it. And uh, my son came out second in the world. And uh, I think he, he won the United States mm -hmm. section of it. And you taught him, or you got him interested in it? I got him interested yeah, yeah. in it, yes. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a remarkable young man. He, I don't know if you've read uh, Khalil Gibran. Uh, he talks about oh, yeah. the, mm -hmm. how your children are not your children, but they are the arrows that you shoot into the world. Mm -hmm. And nice. uh, he's uh, my bright little arrow. Mm -hmm. This is a mirror. Yes, yeah. a mirror, yes. Mm -hmm. Terrific. You also, I mean, now we're on the topic now of, of, of Eastern bodily practices more generally. You also famously trained with Bruce Lee yes. um, in the martial art Jeet Kune Do. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit more about that experience. Um, well, I think that that experience really goes back to my, child, my childhood and growing up in Manhattan and being one of the uh, <clears throat> few black families living in what had been an old Irish neighborhood. And the, the Irish guys all thought that they could box. And um, we all had to like run a gauntlet to go shopping. Uh, getting home with, with your hands full of uh, groceries was, uh, was a test, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, the manly art of self-defense is the only way that you can earn respect in, in those circumstances. And uh, I was just a little kid at that time. But my father boxed. So my father was like, well, you, you're just going to have to learn how to use these or you're going to have to stay home. So I, I had always had an, an interest in that. And I remember um, watching fights and listening to fights on the radio with my dad, who, who maintained his, uh, his interest in boxing. It was practical for him. My, my dad was a police officer. So knowing how to box was something that uh, really, for him, was practical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And for me, living in the neighborhood that I lived in, it, it became practical mm -hmm. knowledge. <laughs> but uh, I got Great. over it. But uh, finally, when I was at UCLA, I was aware of uh, Bruce Lee as the, the lead character on The Green Hornet. Mm -hmm. And somebody introduced me to him. And I, I ended up, I, I trained with him for four years. It was a great experience. He's he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and and so these two practices, and and there are probably more, but but the the martial art and and yoga, um, as Eastern practices. You, you mentioned flexibility as something that uh, marks uh, Eastern practices from some of the Western practices, the cardio and the weight training. Is there are there other features that you feel the Eastern practices kind of emphasize that that can can bring them into kind of a complementary relation or? Yeah, I, I think the, the Eastern approach to all of that type of thing is more cerebral. 
and the Western approach is, is more physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you read uh, Eastern authors on what that's about, a lot of American, uh, a lot of Westerners read Sun Tzu, The Art of War, mm -hmm. to figure out what conflict is about and how to, how to plan. And of course, military people find this very useful. I, I uh, have myself, um, I've read Sun Tzu, but I also enjoy reading uh, Miyamoto Musashi. He was a Japanese samurai. He wrote a book on, on tactics and strategy called The Book of Five Rings. Mm -hmm. And it, it all starts here mm -hmm. with them. And uh, I think in the West, it, it starts with your physique. Uh, mm -hmm. it, and so it's a, maybe we approach the, the subject from different ends, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow they meet in the middle. Thanks. I'll take the next slide, please. So we've get, from the conversation, we've gathered that um, you have quite, uh, quite an intellectual life. And here, this is uh, actually the cover of one of your six scholarly books, most of which seek to popularize knowledge about African Americans' contributions to history. I feel like I'm making some noise here. No, is it? Oh, it's there, okay. <laughs> um, and these are contributions that, that otherwise would have been forgotten. We've talked briefly about a season on the reservation, and you mentioned um, how that book talks about the connections between American Indians and African Americans. Um, and so that's one historical uh, interest for you. Um, what made you decide to study and write about history in particular? I always uh, enjoyed history. The, the part of Manhattan I grew up in was the last part of Manhattan that the Continental Army held before they got chased across the river into New Jersey and George Washington and everybody ended up in Valley Forge. But they lost the battle on Long Island and retreated into Manhattan and then got chased from the heights of Manhattan across the Hudson River. They went down through New Jersey to Valley Forge to get, to get away from the British Army that, that was chasing them. And as a kid, we would find in the neighborhood, let's say in, bro in vacant lots or there was one hillside in particular. Um, we'd find bottles and musket balls and arrowheads. Mm -hmm. And um, Inwood Hill Park is in this neighborhood. And the Lenape Indians, uh, who were there pre-Western contact, that was more or less where they, they hung out. And we would find arrowheads and stuff in there. So I was very much aware that people uh, that came before me were, were there. There's a Dutch farmhouse called the Dykeman House that's on Broadway and 203rd Street. And it was built by the Dykeman family. It was Dutch farmers who lived there when New York was still New Amsterdam and, and a Dutch colony. So there's a very strong sense of history. If, if you know anything about the neighborhood, you, you're aware of all of this. Yeah. Yeah, so it had very material beginnings for you in a way. Stuff, the yeah, stuff around you. It was yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of musket balls and one Neat. or two arrowheads. Somewhere between the, the fifth grade and high school, they all, those are my baseball cards. They all just, I, I, don't, know, nice. I don't know where they went. You know? They're gone. They, they, I'd be wealthy now. Yeah. If I had those. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a particular book among your scholarly books that stands out as, as your favorite or was the most fun to write? Probably uh, the book I wrote on World War II called Brothers in Arms, mm -hmm. and that has to do with a, a guy that was one of my dad's best friends. Uh, they were police officers together uh, for the New York City Transit Police. And I found out in 1992 that uh, he had fought for General Patton in the 761st Tank Battalion, and that uh, they were involved in the liberation of some of the uh, Nazi death camps. But they, they did very, out, outstanding service, both uh, starting at the, as soon as they started to fight in the SAR campaign, and then the Battle of the Bulge, and then what they did uh, to, to liberate uh, people from the death camps. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, for me, was a labor of love, because it was about someone that I actually knew, and he did something remarkable. These, these people should have been featured in the movie Patton, mm -hmm. and uh, they're not in there. There's only one black soldier in there that gets any uh, visibility, and he's uh, Patton's valet. Mm -hmm. But um, these, these guys 
did remarkable stuff. One of the crucial things that they did was uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, the, the Germans wanted to, to get to Antwerp because if they could push the Allies out of the port of Antwerp, it would be very difficult for the Allies to attack the German heartland. You know, if they had to attack from uh, the French coastline up near England, it would take them a long time and, you know, the fortunes of war can, can shift. Uh, so the control of a, a town in Belgium called Tillet uh, was, was uh, crucial. And the 761st Tank Battalion and the 17th Airborne working together drove the, beat the Germans, beat them up really bad around Tillet and, and drove mm -hmm. them away mm -hmm. and forced them to retreat and control that town. Tillet uh, really controlled all the wor roads that, that led to Antwerp. Mm -hmm. And so your, your research for that book, you interviewed people? I interviewed guys that were in the, uh, in the 761st Tank Battalion. And um, really the most remarkable thing about it was, you know, they, they talked about con combat and everything, but when they spoke about the death camps, um, and the horrible things that they saw there. You know, they, they reverted back to being like 18 to 20 year old kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't, they, these were yeah. gentlemen my father's age, you know, in their 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, they start talking about it and they get that distant look in their eyes when they, when they describe the people looking like walking skeletons. One guy said he saw a, 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 a big jar full of eyeballs and it, it was, some of the things they described were, were really horrific. Mm. And just the, uh, the depravities that were uh, inflicted on, on the Jews and the other people that were, were in the death camp. Yeah. Yeah. So the book pictured here um, is on the shoulders of giants. And this appealed to my English professor side because the Harlem Renaissance, which is what the book focuses on, um, was such an, an important uh, literary and cultural moment um, in the U.S. So you, but in, in this book, you offer a more personalized history, uh, examining kind of how the period, just for the sake of the audience, he examines how the period uh, shaped the person he became. Um, the book has a wonderful chapter on jazz. And in, in my own work on bodies, um, I keep coming back to music as well. So musical rhythm and bodily movement seem really closely related. Um, I wonder if you could riff for a moment on the relationship between music and athletics. Well, I, I think they're, they're very closely, closely related, especially in, in black culture. Um, black dance is very closely related to black rhythmic playing the, the drum. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a, a, a part of it. And uh, in Harlem, uh, the dancers at the Cotton Club and then the, the dancers at the Savoy when they started the Lindy Hop, uh, those, those uh, dance groups, they, it infected America. Everybody got into swing music and mm -hmm. uh, went to dance. And plus, my dad was a jazz musician. He played the trombone. And, um, uh, the music and dance aspect of it is very important. I, I wouldn't be here because uh, my mom and dad met at the Savoy Ballroom. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. <laughs> but it's, it's very special. Uh, Harlem really enabled the world to see what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, the 1920s is, is known as the Jazz Age. And th there's a very good reason for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, America saw that uh, black Americans had a lot more to offer than just uh, being uh, farm laborers. Mm -hmm. And that, that was very important. Uh, Any time that someone as uh, talented and elegant as uh, Duke Ellington can come and entertain you, uh, you'll have a different idea about the culture that, that he came out of. Mm -hmm. um, many people here, uh, you know, I can get into movies now for half price too. Uh, if I had here, it would, be, it would be great, you know, but all of our parents uh, kind of would, would get up and uh, start dancing when they would hear Count Basie. So, uh, you know, Harlem has given uh, America a, a great gift mm -hmm. and um, it continues to, to resonate a, a around the world. Yeah, and so dancing is, is one thing that links the sort of music to the, 
to even you had a chapter chapter on the Harlem Rens, right? Um, right, and so the Harlem so, Rens basketball yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, in, in addition to that, uh, if you go to a jazz performance, there's um, and you, let's say you compare jazz to basketball, mm -hmm. uh, there's the soloist, and that's the person with the ball, and you got to move that around so that everyone gets a chance. Uh, yeah. The right person gets it. In a jazz performance, the people have to listen to each other and react spontaneously to what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what happens in, in a basketball game. When, with the ball bouncing around and, and your, your teammates doing different mm -hmm. things, you have to do things uh, to complement what's happening mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And the more you play together, the more you kind of know easier what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, neat. So, you know, when you see the Lakers doing their thing or Michael Jordan's Bulls, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a little bit of jazz in all of that. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Now, why does the 1920s and 30s uh, Harlem stand out as the era or location that shaped you, and why not something you lived through like the Civil Rights era? Well, uh, I think um, the Civil Rights era definitely affected me also, mm -hmm. but um, the Harlem Renaissance really affected my parents, mm -hmm. and they're the one that in instilled values in me. So when Dr. King and Malcolm X and uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and the other people who were prominent in the civil rights movement did their thing. I understood what was going on and it, it all related back to the Harlem Renaissance. Malcolm X's father was a follower of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. He was part of the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. The political consciousness that Malcolm X absorbed through his parents uh, came from Marcus Garvey, a figure from the Harlem Renaissance, uh, not uh, the 1950s. Right. Um, Dr. King was, his mentor was a man named Vernon Johns, who again was part of the Harlem Renaissance and who learned, who, who developed his approach for uh, social activism during the Harlem Renaissance and transferred that to Dr. King, who used it during the 1950s. Wow. So there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a real connect mm -hmm. there that uh, people aren't, aren't aware of. Yeah. Uh, World War II kind of clunked in between mm -hmm. that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the great migration to the north by black Americans mm -hmm. uh, really ended up with the, with the civil rights movement. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Cool. We'll take the next slide. Um, but I want to ask you about this photograph. Um, speaking of the civil rights era, uh, here's you with Muhammad Ali in the middle. And, and could you tell us, just tell us a little bit about this photograph? Okay, um, I'm sitting right next to Jim Brown. And uh, Bill Russell, a number of, of players from the uh, NFL, and Muhammad Ali is, is there. And we, we got together, Bill Russell and uh, Jim Brown called a meeting of uh, all prominent black athletes to come and try to help Muhammad Ali because he was being uh, singled out by the, uh, by the draft board to be drafted. And he wanted to refuse the draft mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he thought the uh, Vietnam War was illegal and immoral. Mm -hmm. And uh, this meeting was called to, to bring us all together. I was chosen to, to represent uh, young black Americans. But uh, we all got together to try to help Muhammad Ali deal with the issues that he was uh, facing mm -hmm. in, in trying to resist the draft. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, there, there are, I think, many more questions to be asked about this photograph. Um, but in the interest of time, and so maybe the, the audience members can be thinking of some, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the, the final slide, um, which is, of course, um, the shot you made famous around the world. The sky hook is, especially on this screen, uh, marvelous, it's graceful, it's indefensible. And I want you to tell us um, what happened to it in the NBA. Why, why did it die out? Well, the, it, it hasn't endured in the NBA because a lot of the younger players don't think they can do it as well as I did it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I, I'm sure a lot more um, young players would shoot it if coaches today would, would teach young players how to shoot it. It's, it's not that hard. But um, the whole idea of uh, learning a game, most coaches teach uh, young players the skills that guards need, you know, ball handling, shooting longer shots. Uh, defense in, in the wide open court. And front court skills really have suffered. Most guys, it, it takes them a while to learn those. 
before uh, you know they're, they're, they become adept at it, uh, playing the game right close to the basket. So I, I think that that uh, really is what it's all about. But um, that hook really is something that I learned uh, using the, the George Mikan drill. And George Mikan went to school here at DePaul. He had a drill where he worked on his hook shot and he shot it with either hand right in front of the basket. And when I was in the fifth grade, some guy said, since you're the tallest kid in your class every year, we're gonna teach you how to shoot this shot because you'll probably be a center. I have to really appreciate their wisdom. This was that. some, just some guy? Just some guys? Yeah, uh, these guys went to Manhattan College. Okay, cool. <laughs> which is very close to where my grade school was in Manhattan. And um, they would help my grade school coach who had too many things to do. So he'd give it over to these mm -hmm. college kids and he said, Kareem, you're gonna, you're gonna learn this shot. So I, they gave me the, the basic footwork and how to do it. I was in the fifth grade and that's all I did uh, for the next couple of years. I, I worked on that shot until it was second nature to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I, I could shoot it uh, the way I did. Mm -hmm. But uh, in trying to teach uh, young men now how to shoot it, they, they have to start from scratch mm -hmm. And they're already in their 20s almost. And yeah. it's, they're like they have a, a set idea how they want to play the game. Mm -hmm. And doing what I did and doing it well mm -hmm. seems to be a, a remote possibility for yeah. them. Yeah, and all the footwork so. that seems to get taught these days is uh, facing the basket. Right. Whereas from the side or in From the side the or, or with or it behind you. Yeah. With the basket yeah. behind you, you've got to do different things. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I had, I had one good student, An Andrew Bynum, who, mm -hmm. who plays for the Lakers. He, he listened to me enough to, to get enough of it down to, mm -hmm. to be effective. And uh, he just signed a contract two years ago for $50 million. So. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe he'll revive it. <laughs> maybe. He, well, it, he doesn't shoot it doesn't like do I, this guy. I shot No, it, but, nobody shoots it like you do. <laughs> but that's, that's life. But he, he's, yeah. he's doing well, so I'm yeah. very happy that's for him. That's terrific. Great. Well, well, thank you for your time, and we're going we're gonna to have some questions, I think. Just got, yeah, here we go. Kareem, I sure, no, you sure. Yeah, stand up and speak. Kareem, I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say we're so glad you came, and we'd like to thank you. Well, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. I would like to ask if you would speak to what I would consider somewhat of a contrast. Growing up in New York, being uh, unique, somewhat taller than most, and an African American in that time and period, only to become successful and an icon in the sport of basketball. Well, I, I think I, I was very lucky. I, I spoke to you about uh, the fact that I was able to watch Bill Russell and learn basically from him. I, I watched Wilt a lot, but um, would Wilt, Wilt always scored more points and stuff, but his team never won. <laughs> and Bill Russell's team won. So I, 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 got, I got the idea of like what worked and uh, what got you uh, a lot of headlines. Wilt got the headlines, Bill Russell got 11 rings. So. I, I learned about that, and I, I wanted to emulate that. And the reason that I went to UCLA was because uh, one, another one of my heroes, uh, Jackie Robinson, had gone to UCLA, and he had excelled. My mom had always pointed him out uh, for the fact that, yeah, he's a great baseball player, but he's intelligent and articulate and had a dignity that he was not going to give up uh, for anything. And uh, that was something that uh, had, a, had a great impression on me. I got a letter from him uh, when I was a senior in high school telling me that uh, UCLA would be a great place for me to go to school. So uh, all those things factored in for me on uh, making my choice to go to UCLA. And I got to play for, for Coach Wooden, who really reinforced those things. A lot of people don't know about Coach Wooden's uh, uh, stance on, on racial matters. In 1947, he was coaching at Indiana State, and they had a very good team. They got invited to the NAIA uh, tournament in Kansas City, and uh, he was very happy. He got the phone call. 
they said, look, we'd love for your team to come. You've got a great team. They'll, they'll fit right in. We've got a lot of very good teams here. It should be a great tournament. And Coach Wooden said, oh, yeah, that's great. And the guy from the tournament said, look, there's only one thing. You, you have a, a black player on your team. Uh, you can't bring him. This, this tournament's for white players only. And Coach Wooden said, oh, geez, that's great. That's wonderful. I hope you guys have a great tournament. <laughs> and he hung the phone up on the guy. And, uh, you know, nobody, uh, nobody really is aware of that. The next year, Coach Wooden's team did even better. This is 1948, right? Got the same call from the same guy. Look, we want you to come. And he, he gave him the same runaround. And Coach Wooden said, look, if I can't bring my whole team, we're not coming. And the guy relented. He said, all right, you, you can bring the guy. The, the black player on Coach Wooden's team did not even start. He, he wasn't a very crucial player for, for the success of the team. But that, that's where Coach Wooden was. And Nobody knows much, very much about this. this. It's been since 1948, some 60 years ago. And nobody's really aware of it. Uh, and Coach Wooden has never uh, tried to share the story with people. But, you know, those people, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, to find out about it. But that's the type of person that he was. And um, that's why he was able to teach us, because um, he always without fail, walked it like he talked it. And um, we, we all love and respect him for that, and um, we don't want to let him down. Because I know he's somewhere with, with his uh, program rolled up uh, <laughs> watching nice. us. Nice. Let's see, who's got the next? Yeah, thank you. This is a two-part question. At a young age, you were very tall, and was that really hard to adjust to? at that time, and was there ever consideration that you would not play basketball? Was there something else you would have done? Um, sometimes it was tough being tall because you know how kids can be. If you're different, uh, yeah, you, you might. But my parents were able to overcome that. They always gave me very positive uh, examples of things that were tall, like the Empire State Building and, and the, giant, <laughs> the giant redwoods. They said I could be like that. <laughs> Maybe be majestic. Nice. Um, yeah, and there was a chance where I, I wasn't going to play uh, basketball. If it had been the way I started out, I, I would have played for the Dodgers. I wanted to play on Jackie Robinson's team, you know. I wanted to replace Gil Hodges at first base and, <laughs> you know, show everybody how good I was with the baseball bat. But uh, basketball prevailed. Good evening, sir. Um, I actually have a question in regards to your physical abilities versus your mental capacity. Um, in that I saw your segment on the blacklist, and you had mentioned that your time at UCLA provided you with a lot of opportunities to meet individuals like Miles Davis and um, different individuals that were kind of at the forefront of black is beautiful, being black is being proud. I wonder, though, kind of referencing the photo with Muhammad Ali, did you ever at any point during your activism becoming aroused, as it were, that you resented that your activism was brought to the, the public forum because of your athletic abilities versus the fact that you were a young black man growing up during the civil rights movement? Uh, no, I, I never resented that. I, I was very thankful that I had something that, that made me uh, stand out from the crowd other than my height, you know, that I, I had some skill to go along with the height. And uh, being at UCLA, may, maybe some of the more attractive co-eds would know, notice that, you know. <laughs> so um, it, it didn't bother me. Hello. Oh, where are you? Oh, over here, yes. <laughs> In the on the left. Over okay. Here. Yes. Um, Kareem, you've accomplished, like, many things in your life, right? Sorry. You've accomplished many things in your life right now, such as like um, being a dominant force in the NBA, writing books. Is there anything like you're trying to do right now in your life? Right now, I'm trying to do a documentary based on my latest book, uh, On the Shoulders of Giants. You saw the cover of it earlier. So I'm trying to be a filmmaker now. And uh, that's, that's been quite a challenge. But uh, I have a film that will be coming out in February about, it, it basically tells the story of the book. 
getting it done was, uh, to me, it was like trying to move a glacier. <laughs> but um, we got it, somehow we got it up and running. And I have to give my, my partner and manager, uh, Deborah Morales, and a, lot of, a lot of the credit for that. But uh, it, it's going, uh, I, we're going to have a premiere here in Chicago. I invite all of you to come and see it. I hope that you enjoy it. Last question, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to ask you a question about your film career. Um, I saw about five years ago the final Bruce Lee film um, that he made. Um, and I so thoroughly was amazed at both of your battle, your battles together. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, what that was like for you and then many years later, your other film uh, features as a Jedi warrior. I, you got me confused with somebody else about the Jedi warrior. <laughs> I think that was Samuel Jackson got to be... Uh... <laughs> yes, it, it was Samuel Jackson. Uh, another handsome, bald-headed guy. <laughs> Getting to do the movie with, with Bruce was really a, a dream come true because when I was training with him, he, he had promised me, look, if, if I ever get a chance to do movies, he was just doing TV then, he said, if I ever get a chance to do movies, it'd be perfect to have you come in and, and be a villain and we can fight and I can kill you and all of these things. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, it, it happened. Uh, <laughs> Summer of 72, I, I went to Hong Kong and we shot that movie. And uh, it really, it's kind of bittersweet for me to, to, to remember it because uh, we shot our scenes in the movie and then I, I had to come back and start the NBA season. And Bruce took me to the airport and that's the last time I saw him. So uh, it's, it's, it's very poignant for me in, in that sense. But he, he was a wonderful man. He, he enjoyed practical jokes. He never took himself seriously as everybody else was masterly and all. He, he, he wasn't into all of that. He was very uh, practical and uh, loved his family, loved his kids, and uh, really did everything he could to, uh, to make them comfortable and happy. So he, he, he again, uh, was a, a great inspiration for me because he, uh, ma he was self-made and he, he did it his way a lot of the things that, that he did with regard to the martial arts went against the prevailing culture at that time. All of the various martial arts, for example, if you studied a style that started in Korea, that would be the only style you studied and everything else stunk. Um, if you studied a Japanese style, that's the only style, it's the only worth world, worth, worthwhile style, everything else stinks. And Bruce understood that you had to be eclectic. You had to learn from Japanese styles and Korean child, styles, Chinese styles. And uh, one of the, a great inspiration uh, to Bruce Lee was Sugar Ray Robinson. He said he had the, the greatest uh, hand techniques uh, that uh, he, he had seen. And just the fact that his mind was, was open uh, to things that worked uh, really helped me understand uh, uh, what it meant to, to have uh, preconceived, uh, immovable ideas. They, they don't usually serve you very well because uh, life has a way of throwing things at you that uh, don't fit into any box and they'll, they'll clock you in the middle of the nose if you, if you don't uh, get an idea that, uh, that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.